the birth of modern surfing can be traced to the year 1911 at a place called Waikiki Beach. It was here that a group of Hawaiian surfers, most notably Duke Kahanamoku, formed the Hui Nalu. This club of the waves focused on native Hawaiian sports like surfing, canoe paddling, and ocean swimming, resurrecting a way of life almost exterminated by Christian missionaries in earlier decades. Riding giant finless slabs of koa wood, this masterful group wired the waves at castles, queens, canoes, and public baths. As the tourist trade found its way to the islands, members of the Hui Nalu were there to greet them. Lounging under the Hau tree at the Moana Hotel, the original Waikiki Beach Boys like Blue Makua, Panama Dave, and Turkey Love were always available to haul willing visitors into the lineup for a modest fee. It became perhaps the world's most enviable occupation. The Waikiki Beach Boys were afforded more time in the lineup than any group of surfers before or since. And while their equipment was archaic, their wave knowledge was sheer genius. Canoe steersman Blue Makua could line up a swell from a distance of half a mile. Duke could connect three different breaks on a single ride. Tarzan Smith powered triple overhead waves at Sunset Beach in 1939. Well, you, you talk about the, the old time beach boys, you're talking about Steamboat, you're talking about Rabbit, you're talking about Henry K. Kai, Niga, Jama, you're talking about Leffin John, Panama, you Chick Daniels, and Endless. They play music. They was beautiful people. They had a lot of aloha, and the, everything had aloha. The, the place was still open. Waikiki was still uh, studios. Summertime, party every day. Every day, wintertime, surf, dive, and enjoy. That's how it used to be. Of this original group, only a handful are alive today. One of the most inspirational is 82-year-old Albert Rabbit Kakai. Rabbit began surfing in the 1920s at public baths before moving down the beach to Waikiki proper, absorbing the teachings of the period's finest watermen along the way. The vibe at home was different. His family was impoverished and his father brutal. The waves of Queens must have seemed a paradise. Under the Hau tree, absolute legends like Duke Kahanamoku held court, plinking on ukuleles, sharing tali, and eyeing the surf. This was Rabbit's university. 75 years later, Rabbit is as sharp as a tack and a walking Smithsonian as far as surf history is concerned. He has selflessly devoted himself to coaching young Hawaiian competitors for half a century and is perhaps the most beloved surfer alive. Been around for so many generations, like a like a dictionary. You know, I can definitely ask him anything, and, and he would know. I think Rabbit Kikai represents everything that the Duke passed on. You know what I mean? He, when the Duke's passing, I mean, shoot, I think Rabbit just picked up. He was always there, always on the beach. You know, always had good stuff to say. You know, do this, do that. You look more like me. <laughs> from Tom Blake to Tom Curran, and from Sonny Kuna to Sonny Garcia, Rabbit surfed with them all. Kakai himself is cited as being in the water for the invention of hot dog surfing, and he was shaping surfboards by the time he was 10. All of it came from the Waikiki wellspring, and that long ago era is forever etched in his memory. He's always happy to share his tales. Well, I was in training like about eight, nine years old, and Duke used to take me out on his wings and, you know, trying to steer, uh, teach me all the canoes. Goes out with him, and I sit behind him, you know, and I steer the boat, I sit in front of him, I steer the boat. And he watched me the way I handle those big boats with the, with the tourists. It's pretty good. He sits back there with his paddle, he don't even paddle, or just watch me take off, and I tell them, you know, just like the way they do it. And it got so that I got pretty good. Then I was licensed at a very tender age, at 14. And I was the youngest guy to be a legal captain, outrigger captain, take the boat out with tourists, and also teaching surfing lessons. And Duke was the first guy that gave me my license. In those days, we didn't have the city to give us license, and you're licensed by Duke and some of the big guys down there. If they say you can do it, you can do it. And I learned a lot of things from him, just like taking off on the big waves. He told me, son, if you think you can do it, do it. 
He said, don't be ashamed. If you know you can't do it, don't do it. Don't be ashamed, because you live to fight another day. <laughs> and that's the word of Duke. Legendary surfer Rabbit Kakai came of age at the right place at the right time. If a surfer could access a time machine, transporting himself to any surf landscape in history, he could do no better than to arrive at surfing's fertile crescent circa 1930. The pre-war years at Waikiki were absolutely idyllic. Only two structures of any real magnitude occupied the beach, grand, stately buildings that still outclass any of their neighbors. The Moana Surfrider and the Royal Hawaiian bookended the best surfing beach anywhere. Temperate waters and warm trade winds led to a 365-day surf season. And the soft rolling waves were as fun for hot surfers as they were perfect for instruction. The Beach Boys, a romantic band of watermen if there ever was one, dominated the scene. Young boys from the depression-hammered neighborhoods just inland were captivated by their flair and easy mastery of the ocean. For Rabbit Kakai, it was Duke Kahanamoku that set the pace for skill, grace, and social ease. Well, he has sort of a authority, like, because everybody looks up to him, you know, because of the thing that he has, like renown and everything famous, being an Olympic champion, everybody looks up to him for that. And that's how Duke sort of, uh, he doesn't push his weight around. He just walks around like regal, regal-like, you know? And people ask him, he smiles and answers questions, everything like that. Taught me to be polite to people, never. Somebody walk in and I'm interviewing, like you interviewing, they say, hi, rabbit, I always say hi, you know? Sometimes I don't know who the person. Same thing with the Duke. He meet millions of people from all over the world. He always have a sh sh handshake, aloha, you know? At Rabbit's childhood home near the foot of Diamond Head, other lessons were being taught. His father was an abusive disciplinarian, and when Rabbit discusses him, he remembers beatings as if they had just occurred. Like all my brothers are taller than me, and they said, Rabbit, how come you're the short one? My father used to pound the hell out of me, and I go down and down. I'm short, I'm five, six and a half. But I. I learned a lot from him, taking beatings from him, doing the right things and not doing the things. While Rabbit has always been small of stature, he was resourceful, tough as stone, and a natural athlete. And while his longtime friends have good-naturedly nicknamed him Dat's Nuttin' for his habit of outdoing any nearby storytellers, his surfing and canoe steering exploits are without peer. These skills, as well as his abilities on land, were noticed early by his mother. She taught me everything I knew, all my sports and everything when I was a kid, and I was a runner. That's why they call it, he, she named me Rabbit because I just can run, and run fast. And if you do 900 in 95 in 100 yards, that's moving, that's flying. That's what I used to do. So that name stuck with me. And everybody asked me how I got that name. Guys come up with their own opinion. <laughs> well, to each his own. But the truth, I got it from my mom. The young rabbit learned the beach boy trade early, starting in the beach services version of the mailroom by renting out his surfboard and crewing on surf canoes. The small boys were usually associated with one of the licensed concessions, but just as often worked as wildcatters. Kakai tried it both ways. I had seven boards, and that seven boards is uh, acquired from someplace else, a uh, tow foot board that we sort of finagle from someplace else, cut it in half, you get two boards, so I had seven good boards. I used to rent my own boards out, 25 cents a day, and you rent seven boards, that's good enough for me and my family to have a weekend down to the movie, use the usual things, show 10 cents, hot dog 10 cents, a Coke 10 cents, and we live in, you know, just like the upper crust. 25 cents is big money for us guys. So renting the board down there, idle boards, making money. And those guys, they make sure they use their 25 cents worth, morning till night, till they get out, put the boards back. And another day, they can't get it when we're down here. Kakai was on hand for crucial advances in surfboard design and construction. 
He saw the change from Koa to Redwood and from fin-free designs to Skaggs and back again in the hot curl era. Cut the thing back, what you call uh, hot curl boards, the modern hot curl boards. And I shaped my board, my first Redwood boards, like about an eight inch tail with V bottom. And uh, the nose was just almost pointed. Like, I, I watch uh, some of the guys down the Outrigger Club, like the Duke and the guys, they had pointed nose, but, you know, they just down there rode uh, the angle boards. And that's the way I started to copy and make my own shape. Thus began a new era in surfing, marked by link turns and nose rides. Hot dogging had been invented, and surfing would never be the same. On December 7, 1941, Rabbit Kakai and the rest of the Waikiki Beach Boys discovered that the hazards of the world had found their way to paradise. The flock of Japanese Zeros that attacked Pearl Harbor changed the course of history and signaled the end of the pure Beach Boy lifestyle. Well, right after the whole thing happened, and I right out here, they conned in everything off. They barbed wired the whole beach off from one end, the whole island, barbed wired all around. They had gun emplacements over there. They built those uh, little pillboxes out and with guns out here shooting out, you know. And uh, they had curfew, like 5.30, you have to be in here. We used to surf out there at about 5.30. We wouldn't come in. They shoot the guns over our head. Some of the bullets land close to us guys. We come in and we went for those guys. They said, you can give us a warning, we can come in, but don't shoot at us. They said, I tell, they said they didn't. I said, how come the bullets going to shoot you right around us? And I told the guy who was back there that was laughing, I thought, you know something? One of these nights, we got pineapples. You're gonna wake up, we want pineapple right in your pillbox. If things were getting hot in the lineup, business in the water trade was slowing to a trickle. That was just the half of it. Several key members of the beach services community were drafted and shipped to the mainland. Rabbit was nabbed and identified as a candidate for an elite new division of the special forces. He formed the first UDT ever in the whole service of the United States. And I was one of them. We had a 12-man pick crew of all the guys. They picked me because I'm a lifeguard and I know the demolition and everything like that. You know how you become a frogman? <laughs> they give you a pair of fins, a pair of goggles, and they stick a propeller up your ass until you go. You're a frogman. <laughs> That's Rabbit's version. <laughs> Following the Allied victory in the Pacific, Rabbit hung up his flippers and headed back to Waikiki. He was just in time to greet yet another epical shift in surfboard design, the introduction of balsa boards. These new lightweight craft were being introduced to Hawaii by a group of surfers from California, fellows like Matt Kivlin, Joe Quigg, Dave Rocklin, and Tom Zahn. Rabbit and company were getting their first look at accomplished surfers from the mainland, and the Californians were absolutely surf drunk on the potential of Hawaii and the warmth of the Beach Boys. When it came to sheer surfing ability, no one impressed the mainlanders like Rabbit Kakai. Being the first guys to move in was you get like Matt Kivlin, Joe Quigg, and uh, Dave Rocklin, all those guys that they started to come in. From California. From California. That's what the biggest uh, first uh, influx of the the howlies. <laughs> Rabbit uh, was very aggressive, and he would just deliberately go back into the pit and wait for it to get coming over, and he'd come screaming out of there in the barrel. We we do that accidentally once in a while, but he'd do it deliberately on every wave. I never saw anybody do anything like that. And he did it day after day, after, any time there was any surf at all. And he ruled that whole, he ruled Queens. Everybody got out of his way, and he was king. As most surf historians acknowledge, this chance meeting in Waikiki led to the birth of modern surf style. Quig and company took Rabbit's aggression and open face mobility back to Malibu and San Onofre, where young surfers like Mickey Dora and Phil Edwards learned to blend California point style with the whip turns and nose riding of Kakai. 
Rabbit's influence was now being felt in the cool waters of the classic West Coast point breaks. Conversely, Rabbit was enjoying the benefits of high-performance surfboards. It was an interchange that would set the wheels in motion for the coming worldwide surf boom in the 1960s. By the time the 1960s rolled around, Rabbit Kakai was considered to be one of the few watermen from Hawaii worthy of carrying on the legacy of Duke Kahanamoku. His canoe steering skills had seen him across the Molokai Channel on numerous occasions. He had won the international event at Makaha, the era's version of a world surfing title, and he had established himself as one of the most honored and honorable of the Waikiki Beach Boys. He continued to rack multi-session days throughout the next two decades, spending his weekends volunteering his time as a beach marshal in local surfing events and coaching the venerable Waikiki Surf Club Outrigger team. In short, he continued his 60-year tradition of total immersion in the surf. Early in the 1990s, Rabbit took just enough time away from the water to tie the knot with California gal Lynn Hopkins. The two seem custom tailored for one another. I didn't want him to have to worry about anything anymore. That's Nor did I want to worry about anything anymore, but we're, at, we're kind of at that point now where we can do what we want yeah. when we wish, which is very, very fortunate. So we helped each other, really. He, he helped outfit my apartment. I started with one table and no chairs and one old bed. And pretty soon I had a kitchen full of cookware and all sorts of things, silverware and stuff, rabbit got for me. We just sort of made a life from scratch. <laughs> I'm back, day one. <laughs> they operate under a trans-specific two-household program that allows plenty of independence for both. They fly back and forth to one another and make plenty of time to travel. A favorite destination is Boca Barranca, where Rabbit is feted as the man of honor at the toes-on-the-nose Rabbit Kakai Longboard Classic. Now in its eighth year, the event sees surfers from around the globe come together to pay homage to a legendary surfer as well as the mile and a half long left. When you think about a man like Rabbit Kakai, he embodies the spirit of aloha, the Hawaii spirit of aloha. In Costa Rica, there's a saying, it's called pura vida, which is pure life. When you mix the two, it's a perfect match, and therefore the combination is perfect for our contest. Through all of this, he has remained, above all, a beach boy. And while he clearly considers it a noble pursuit, he is nostalgic for a time when the surf instructors gave more than they took. You get the feeling that if he was a bit younger, he'd clean house. What we used to have in our days, spreading the, uh, the, the wealth of what you call aloha, looking after most of the tourists in our own style, you know, and everything, it's gone. This guy's out here is out for the fast buck. They don't care how they make it. That's not to say Kakai doesn't have his favorites on the sand at the foot of the Duke statue. He's tapped ultra-hot surfer and paddler Guy Perry as the beach rat most likely to carry on his legacy, just as he's carried on that of his mentor, Duke Kahanamoku. That's the next guy to replace the rabbit. <laughs> Personality-wise, this guy is number one. That's big shoes. Yep. I think he's one of the best up-and-coming surfer, paddleboard, you name it. He's in it. And he's doing good just like in my time. Yet may we kindly direct your attention to the gleam in Rabbit's eye. It's obvious that he isn't planning on going anywhere. Not just yet, anyway. Your eyes are revealing they're fooling no one. No use concealing we're having some fun. Having surfed relentlessly since 1926, Rabbit's stated goal is to surf for 100 years. Who among us would be so bold as to suggest he can't pull it off? My philosophy in life and looking in the future, I can tell you this much, I'm looking at 100, and I will still be surfing and competing. Everybody laugh, but this is the year of longevity in our family line. While Rabbit cycles through even more decades, it's amazing to realize that his accumulated knowledge is still available to beginning surfers. He still works the waves at Kuhio Beach Park in Waikiki. 
Albert Rabbit Kakai is one of surfing's living treasures and a prime example of the health of the surfing spirit. No use in concealing, we're having some fun. But if you're too young to date or over 98, keep your eyes on the hands they tell us. Hello, 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 hello.